Hi there, I'm Sonal Merotra Kapoor and welcome to Coffee and Crypto. This is your one-stop destination for all things crypto, also the place where we decrypt this very fascinating world of cryptocurrency for you. Okay, I have on the program for you today. The RBI is very soon going to start circulating India's digital currency, the CBDC. Now, if you don't know what that is, you tuned into just the right place. Let's start by telling you what is CBDC. Is it, and questions you know often come, is it another coin? Is it another token? Is it really a blockchain? Well, CC will break down CBDC for you. Too many abbreviations over there. Anyways, let's get uh, started. And for that, for our explainer to tell you all you need to know about India's digital currency, let's go to our coffee wall. All right, so, so many questions about digital currency, how India is going to formulate that as well. We will begin with the basics, all right? What does CBDC even stand for? It stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. Essentially, it's a currency in digital form. But unlike crypto, it's not decentralized. There is no public registry for it. This is digital currency issued and controlled by the central bank of the country. In India's case, it's the RBI. So essentially, it's like your regular rupee note. It's like how... Oh Lord, nobody carries cash these days. I totally sort of slipped out. Oh, thanks Sana for that. That's our producer, by the way, that's Sana. Thanks so much. So it's like cash. Looks does not look like this. It is just something that will work exactly like this note. All right, but the digital form is basically as good as cash, but it is even one step better. Let's tell you how. All right, let's tell you for one, the RBI won't actually need to physically print cash and ensure that it reaches places and reducing dependence on actually transporting, carrying cash around as well. Now, I know you're thinking this sounds just like online transactions, right? Like your Paytm, UPI, etc., etc. Valid question, we'll tell you the difference between that in just a minute. Let's get back to the advantages and how this is one step further from that. Second advantage with this is of digital currency that is that a payment once made is traceable, is final. So the settlement is of course clear and easy. Third advantage with digital currency is that it makes international payments and exchanges even easier. Like why should it be taking you two days to properly get through a payment from Mumbai to New York? Well, digital currency can help in overcoming challenges like time zones, difference in exchanges, forex, etc. Basically, if you're like me, sitting and calculating, converting every time you shop from an international portal or you're in an international holiday, when we used to have international holidays, that is, thinking every time, how much does it cost in Indian rupees? Well, digital currency comes to your rescue as it will show you the price in rupees in real time. Now, we know that RBI is not going to issue it via airdrop randomly, right? There will be a phase-wise manner in which it will be rolled out. There will be targeted users as well. And a pilot project is starting, CC is learning, by December of this year itself. Now, those are the basics. Having understood that, let's move to how is digital currency actually different from any other form of online payment? Options like Paytm, UPI, etc. Well, the most important difference is mobile wallets like Paytm, UPI need to be connected with a bank account from which the money is transacted over internet using smartphones. Now, you can't set up a Google Play account, for example, without linking it to your bank account. But when we talk about digital currency, it doesn't necessarily need to be linked to a bank account to hold it. Got that? Well, this essentially means that your mobile device can be converted into a wallet by itself. So this is very similar to how crypto works. And there, this, my friends, is one of the simple factors why that it will actually bring the entire unbanked population of India on record as well. Besides, of course, modernizing the banking sector and helping us legitimately you know, move towards a cashless economy. Yes, this is very similar to crypto, but not exactly. Let's uh, tell you how. First, as I said, unlike crypto, this will be centralized, regulated by a central bank. Second, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is finite. It's hard capped. 
at about 21 million coins there. In fact, uh, in just a decade from now, 97% of Bitcoins are likely to have been mined already. Whereas when it comes to CBDC, it can be infinitely increased. Third, and the biggest differentiator really, is the tech between how crypto works and how digital currency will work as well. The government is still working out the details, so we'll get to hear more from them later. Now, this brings us to the point where we understand why the government is pitching CBDC as an alternative to crypto. Now, cryptocurrencies are becoming very popular, right? Not just across the globe, but in India as well. In fact, we'll tell you how exactly popular is crypto in India in the second part of the program as well, so stay tuned for that. But we will also tell you how governments across the globe now want to tap on to this popularity. Now, bringing in digital currency experts, say, could actually satisfy a population which is itching to be part of this digital revolution, while also maintaining a central economy. Also, governments cannot monitor or track all cash transactions, right? Now, with this, everything, all transactions actually come on record. Also, however, governments don't just bring in accountability, regulations and taxes when they talk about digital currency. For example, governments also get the power to freeze a specific wallet overnight, something that cannot be done in a crypto space at all. So that's pretty much all you need to know about digital currency. But of course, I cannot end this explainer without actually mentioning China in all of this. Now, China, whose digital currency, the digital one, has already hit the markets. Some firms in China have started paying employees in digital currency as well. The People's Bank of China is one of the first central banks to develop and push for CBDC, giving the government power to track spending real time and also importantly, allowing financial surveillance by the Chinese government. Interestingly, this at a time when China is implementing its toughest ever crackdown on crypto. So I leave it for you to decide what you will deduce from that one. All right, that's the explainer. Let's uh, take this conversation on digital currency forward with our guest. Joining us on CC is Ishwar Prasad. He is a professor for economics at the Cornell University, author of the future of money as well, how the digital revolution is transforming currencies and finance. Thank you so much for your time, Ishwar, and welcome to CC. Your first thoughts on what makes this digital currency such a talked about thing, such hot property. And this is one thing that even the governments are very excited about. The interesting thing is that central banks were considering um, how to keep their currencies relevant in a world where digital payments are becoming increasingly the norm. Um, and I think cryptocurrencies have given central banks um, a sort of kick in the pants to get started on this. The motivations for issuing a CBDC differs by country. You spoke about financial inclusion, mm -hmm. bringing more people into the financial system, giving them easy access to digital uh, payments at a low cost. And that's true for a number of developing countries, but there are other motivations at play. In a country like Sweden, where the private sector is providing digital payments very effectively, mm -hmm. the central bank there, the Riksbank, is thinking of issuing an e-kroner largely to serve as a backstop to the private payments infrastructure so that in case of a crisis of confidence or so on, you would have a government pay payment option. And China is an interesting case, as you mentioned. There, much like in India, there are private sector digital payments that are easily available to a lot of the population. But the central bank wants to keep its money relevant at the retail level and not cede the entire payment space to private uh, payment providers. Mm. So there is this range of motivations, but I think the reality is that this is the way the entire world is going. China is undertaking trials as is Sweden. The Bahamas has already rolled out the world's first uh, nationwide digital currency, the sand dollar. Japan is undertaking experiments and uh, um, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank are not far behind. And so is India. So I think the era of cash is drawing to an end. Wow. Era of cash coming to an end. That's a strong statement to make over there. But hold on to the thought about China because there's so much to discuss when it comes to that. Let me also introduce the other guest with us today, Dilip Cherian. 
founder and consulting partner at Perfect Relations. Where Dilip, you've seen in various avatars on the channel as well. But today he joins us as an expert and also as an insider because he's part of the Policy 4.0 Advisory Committee and a member of India CBDC Policy Matters as well. Uh, welcome, Dilip, to CC. Thank you. Give us what we don't know about digital currency so far. And you know, one of the basics that I want to really uh, understand is what do you think will onset or coming in of a digital currency in India due to the already open crypto market? You know, as you said, the two are actually uh, fairly different products and, and different spaces. Uh, what is happening in the crypto market uh, is that, as the professor just said, uh, has given a kick in the pants to the central bank. They recognize that the chances that they are going to become irrelevant is going to be high. But a, a CBDC, by its definition, is not crypto because of the fact that it is still fiat money. And the entire basis on which uh, crypto is created is that we, the people, don't believe the platforms that government has created. And we think that value needs to reside somewhere else in some other method. Second, I think that uh, if you look at what the Chinese yuan is doing and policy 4.0 has worked on it, um, the kind of engineering that has gone into the Chinese CBDC is actually getting it as close to a kind of decentralized, uh, except it's government controlled, uh, as possible to really make it completely digital. But where all of these fail is that, except for the Swedish experiment hmm. and what they are doing, all these also have embedded in them the sense of control by government. Hmm. Government wants to add another layer of big brotherly watching over you, where you spend your cash, are you paying your taxes, how hmm. often are you spending, where did you make your money from, etc. So I think there is the engineering part which we mm. need to think mm. about. And I think that the Reserve Bank and others would do well to understand from experts who inevitably will be outside the government domain, who understand what the technology and what the implications of this could right. be if it is done badly and what should be done right to make it worthwhile. Talking about implications, let me uh, go back uh, to Ishwar on that. Ishwar, so what do you think it will do to things like platforms like Paytm or online transactions or UPI, etc. that is also so popular in India now. You go to a you know, vegetable seller on the road and he is accepting Paytm now. So the remarkable thing um, is that in countries like China and India, which used to be behind in digital payments compared to the advanced economies, there is actually less of a user case um, for CBDCs. Because as you said, there are very effective digital payments that are already um, in operation. But I think there are other benefits to having a CBDC. You talked about how it might help pull economic activity out of the shadows. It might um, uh, make it harder to use central bank money for illicit transactions, mm. which will certainly be, be benefits. But I think the risks need to be kept in mind as well. Mm. Um, one of the forms that a CBDC can take mm. might be um, essentially central bank accounts that are available to households. And the technology is now available to make uh, uh, these digital wallets in which CBDCs could be held um, accessible to all households um, in an economy. And that poses a potential threat of disintermediation of the banking system if people move their deposits to a central bank account, believing it to be safer. Mm. It could reduce innovation by private sector um, participants in terms of payments. Um, and it also has privacy issues, as you mentioned. But I think technology is showing us a way around some of these technical as well as conceptual problems. China, for instance, is setting up different grades of CBDC digital wallets. If you want to undertake high value transactions, you have to provide your identity to a commercial bank or other um, institution that can undertake know your customer um, uh, regulatory requirements. But 
if you want to use a digital wallet for low value transactions um, you can use digital wallets that give you a much greater degree of anonymity i see but certainly the reality mm. is that everything digital ultimately leaves a trace and no central bank wants to have its currency not be auditable and traceable mm. so we're going to have to have these conversations about whether we are ready for cbdc not just from an economic mm. or technocratic perspective mm. but also from a societal perspective because leaving cash behind is going to involve some sacrifices yeah and you know that's the beauty of it all because if you look at what's happening with digital currency in, in regard to and in the backdrop of crypto and i want they live to answer this question as well the the only question that a layman has about crypto today is that it's not regulated government we don't know how it's going to come in on this one and look at the conversation on the other hand when it comes to digital currency government also for being forced in a way to come in and jump on the bandwagon like we said we don't know what tech is going to be involved in this just yet but this actually benefits the government in so many ways so it really opens up a lot of avenues for crypto in india as well sure in fact the biggest advantage of crypto is that it opens up a range of economic innovation that otherwise is not possible because suddenly you have a a fiat currency which is the basis of everything that you're doing digitally hmm. and you know that it is backed by the central bank so uh properly done it could unleash a new wave of entrepreneurship hmm. but as uh, professor ishwar uh, Pras prasad said that the danger to banks to conventional banks exists we need to be conscious of that hmm. yet is it more worth your while to unleash a new wave of economic entrepreneurship new kinds of payments new options new savings instruments etc mm. which will happen as cbdc's get rolled out mm. and there lies the opportunity for government and it could be as i said a new engine of growth It is indeed, and so much to explore on that front. But for now, Ishwar Dilip, thank you both for joining us in this very fascinating conversation. We'll keep talking about how the rollout is actually going to happen once we get more information on that. That's actually a good point to take a break on, because what's coming up on the other side is how exactly popular is crypto in India? We actually have a survey result on that, and joining us will be Anand. who's the executive director of and heads that entire survey that was done and the numbers are really going to shock you how many people in india actually use crypto details coming up on the other side Welcome back on CC today we spoke about digital currency but the other big issue that a lot of people still wonder when it comes to crypto is how exactly popular is crypto how many people are invested how big is the market cap and while there is no one way to actually answer those questions so joining us is Anand Pateshwaram who has done a very exciting survey on this he's the executive director of uh, BFSI practice head and Kantar which has done this entire survey so Anand let me start by throwing in some of the numbers that came out from your survey right 16% yes. of urban india actually owns crypto that's one of the key headlines there tell me uh, what all constitutes to that number uh, absolutely uh, sonal uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to the show okay uh, in fact what we really saw was the awareness was quite high okay the awareness itself was around 83% hmm. and one of the aspects that we really felt was that why is awareness so high so we went and checked back the social media data and the buzz on twitter for the last one year okay especially from march 2021 has been extremely high yeah that's when we had the tweet by elon Absolutely. musk that's the yes. time that's what got in the crypto revolution even in india yes and you see that there's a little bit of a negative sentiment at that point of time because of the 
uh, tweet okay and then it comes back again to positive mm. but what really happened during that time was that there was a wave literally happened and there was a, a extremely high buzz which was really there and that buzz in particular in the last few months has actually translated into uh, the ownership yeah of 16% Hmm. One of the aspects which I want to really say out here from an ownership perspective, okay, and why we are really talking about this particular aspect hmm. is if you see uh, crypto as a currency, okay, and Bitcoin in particular has been there for the last ten uh, years, for example, hmm. yeah, but okay, it is actually garnering almost half of what mutual fund is currently in terms of interest and intention. Hmm. Yeah. I see so that. That's I also saw in your survey very interesting, you know, bits for me to pick up were that how it's most popular in metro cities. How again the ownership sort of stays between twenty-one to thirty-five year olds, and the older you get, actually you go on to put in a amount. You know, you got to you you can't have all your eggs in the same basket. So people continue hmm. to invest in crypto, but that's not the only source of investment. Quick thirty seconds to wrap up on what was the big learning for you. the big learning was diversification people are looking for diversification of their portfolio especially when it really comes to risk taking ability they want to really have multiple okay uh, investment avenues in their basket yeah and uh, two aspects to the 21 to 35 year old okay uh, versus the uh, 35 to 45 okay what you can really see is the uh, entry point is low right now if you see all the crypto exchanges have been talking about 100 rupees and even uh, very small sums of investment like you actually do in a sip Years back, okay, in mutual fund, so the entry points are really smaller, but the value is actually going to be bigger in the thirty-five to forty-five year old, okay, because that's where they sure. are looking for a Makes larger sense. diversification. Yeah. yeah, all right, that's all the time we have uh, for uh, CC today. Thanks so much for your insight. That was a quick update that we got on how popular is actually crypto in India. Well, that's all we could pack in this week's edition of Coffee and Crypto. Do write to us if you want to know in particularly. Uh, more stuff about in the crypto world what to do how to do we'll be here to answer all those questions so see you again next friday bye for now